Consider this. In the second quarter of this year, profits at six of the largest producers publicly traded oil companies were more than $70 billion. That's $70 billion in just one quarter, 90 days, $70 billion. So far, American oil companies are using that windfall, the windfall of profits, to buy back their own stock, passing that money on to their shareholders, not to consumers. In fact, in the first half of the year, those same companies spent $20 billion buying back their own stock, and most importantly, buying back a buyback, the most significant buyback in the last almost a decade. That's great if you own a lot of stock in an oil company or if you're an executive in an oil company. It puts a lot of money in your pocket. That is how you get paid. Okay. Do it. Mm -hmm. Do it. Welcome back, everybody. Chevron plans a massive $75 billion buyback. That is triple the size of its previous authorization that was unveiled back in 2019. The company is also hiking its dividend. Today is Thursday, the 26th of January. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. Now, folks, I got a good one for you tonight. And let's start by this. I am not the uh, best political analyst out there, but I did make a good prediction back in 2020 when I predicted that Joe Biden will win the elections and become the next president of the United States. And at the time, all of the experts, quote unquote, they were saying if Biden wins, it will be the end of oil stocks. The oil industry will get crushed like you have never seen before. You don't want to invest in energy. Energy is dead. But here, in this channel, I told you clearly that if Joe Biden gets elected, it will be the best thing that ever happened to the oil industry. And you gotta go long oil with both hands. All in. And of course, at the time, oil stocks, Exxon, Chevron, they were down in the toilet. Nobody wanted oil stocks at all. But that was the opportunity. And since then, this channel has been bullish energy all the way. And most recently, a lot of uh, analysts and experts were saying that we've seen the top in oil and energy stocks is a fade. They're not going to work in 2023. You got to chase technology. You got to chase uh, the trashiest names, the RKKs of the world. Yet I told you a couple of weeks ago, we will see the revival of the energy trade and inflation. Inflation will come back and the energy trade will come back. Oil prices will skyrocket again. And most importantly, energy stocks will make new highs. And this week, we got yet another catalyst, another tailwind that will push oil prices and oil stocks to move higher and higher and higher. Because if you want to talk about, hey, the bear market is over and we have a new bull market, guess what? What? The bull market never died. The bull market has been here all along. But the bull market is not in the Dow Jones. It's not in the S&P. It's not in the Nasdaq. It's not in tech. Instead, the bull market has been in value. Most importantly, energy. So let's talk about it. And here it is. In Focus Tonight. Get rich, baby. There is only one guaranteed way, and that is investing in oil right now. Why do we say that? To begin with, when we look at the sector's performances last year, all negative. Tech, real estate, healthcare, staples, financials, utilities, all down. There was only one sector in the entirety of the stock market that managed to close positive by a lot. Matter of fact, closing the year with gains north of 33%, and that is energy. And the fundamentals in energy couldn't be any better. You're not going to find these kind of fundamentals even in the top technology names, the big caps. Their margins are going down, not the case in the energy cohort. For example, when we look at the forecast for big oil profits, they're now standing at the highest level in the century. Furthermore, when we look at the excess cash in big oil companies, it exceeds the S&P 500 by a mile. The S&P stands at 4.9%, energies all in all at 22.1%. But there is one name that stands out as having perhaps the best financials and fundamentals out of all 
these big oil companies, and that is Chevron. For example, when we look at the debt ratio across the big oil names, BP stands at 31.2%, Shell at 25.6%, Exxon 23.6%, and the average for energies 23.6%, but Chevron stands at 18.6%. So Chevron has the lowest debt ratio. On top of that, energy companies are not spending anymore. They're not wasting cash anymore. Whatever money they make, they're saving a lot of that money. Now, you might ask, why aren't these oil companies spending more money in investments? and perhaps drilling or exploration or new technologies? I think you know the answer. The answer is because we have a war against oil companies. We're telling them, don't invest any more cash. We want to kill your business. We want to end your business in favor of green energy. And in response, oil companies are saying, okay, so why would we invest at all? We're just going to keep the cash. And of course, Chevron raised its 2023 budget, but it is well below the historic levels, meaning they can raise more and more and more if they want to. And here's what Chevron is actually doing with the cash. Yesterday, we got the headline and it was absolutely mind blowing. Chevron announced $75 billion worth of buybacks. And on top of that, to sweeten the deal, they also increased dividends. Now, you know my stance on buybacks. I think they're frauds. I think they should be illegal. I think they create no value to the shareholders at all. I'd rather have dividends, but we have a problem with dividends of double taxation. So these companies favoring buybacks for now. Regardless, this is one of the biggest buybacks in history. We've never seen a number like this before, except perhaps with Apple. And and immediately, the stock of Chevron shot up higher by more than 4% today in response to this piece of news. But of course, this did not come out without pissing off the Biden administration. Take a look. If you listen to the, the, uh, the president's commentary on buybacks, uh, this is something he views as uh, you know, problematic when it's excessive. And that's one of the reasons why the Inflation Reduction Act had a 1% increase on a, on, on a, on a not increase, introduced a 1% tax on buybacks. That's in uh, legislation now. That's actually, that's something that's been legislated. It's in the field. And so that's not specifically for one sector over another. And uh, in, in fact, back when he was vice president, when I worked for him, uh, the president uh, was raising his eyebrow at some of the excessive buybacks, trying to understand if these were, you know, really productive for the economy or if these were just um, corporations with more money than they knew what to do with. He really wants Americans to continue to benefit from some breathing room at the pump. As we've said, they've gotten that since the peak from last summer, uh, and that's really important to him. And it's also behind two things we've talked about so far, the deceleration in headline inflation down six months in a row, and the uh, coming in somewhat of uh, near-term inflationary expectations that, that typically tracks the gas price. And folks, this is really important. The Biden administration right now are shitting their pants. They're panicking. Why are they panicking, Maverick? The answer is, look at what's going on to gasoline prices year to date. Oil prices to begin with, the commodity surging higher. And we're seeing the reflection right now at the pump. U.S. gasoline prices up by 9% so far this year. We have all of these experts, quote-unquote, who say that inflation is dead, it's over, and the Fed must cut rates, it's done. Meanwhile, gasoline prices went higher by 9% in this month alone. Oh, we're just warming up here, baby. This is just the beginning. And the reason is, a major headwind for oil prices, keeping them from moving higher, was the depletion of the SPR, which stands for the nation's strategic petroleum reserve. In response to higher energy prices last year, the Joe Biden administration decided to deplete the SPR. Well, now they can no longer do that. And the reason is, the Republicans in the House and the Senate introduced a bill restricting Biden's ability from depleting the SPR anymore. And of course, the White House is now threatening to veto the bill. And in response to that, President Biden today tweeted, Our petroleum reserve is one of the best supply tools we have to protect Americans from disruptions that spike gas prices. House Republicans want that solution off the table. Of course, he's lying through his teeth because the depletion of the SPR didn't happen because we had disruptions. There were no disruptions. The depletion of the SPR was to artificially prevent the oil rally from happening. But now, the administration will no longer be able to do that with or without the new 
new bill. And the reason is the SPR is depleted so much, it will be an absolute disaster, a national security issue. If the administration continues to deplete the SPR at this point. Matter of fact, for now, they're looking to replenish the SPR. The problem is, the administration is looking for 70 bucks and below to start buying these barrels. The problem is, if you look at the futures, for now at least, both the WTI and Brent trading above 80 bucks a barrel. And my expectations are they will continue to move higher and higher and higher. And the reason is we have the China reopening. Now, China reopening means that all of this pent up demand in the Chinese economy is now back in line. They're looking to consume oil. They're looking to buy and perhaps hoard a lot of oil. And this will push prices higher. At some point, the Joe Biden administration will have no other choice but to capitulate and start buying oil at whatever price it's trading at right now be it 85, be it 90, be it 100, because they will realize that oil will move from this point, whatever point it is, higher and higher and higher. And buying it today at 95, at 100, is a lot better than buying it at 120 later on. This will continue to push oil prices higher and higher and higher. And with that comes a lot of profits, a lot of money for all of these big energy companies. Now the question becomes, besides the reckless decisions by the monetary policy, led by the Federal Reserve, of course, what led to this inflation? in energy prices in specific? The answer is the misguided green energy policies. Now, if you know me, you've been watching my channel for a while, you know that I am a proponent of green energy. I want to see the transition to green energy, but I want to see it happening gradually. I don't want to shut down the oil and gas industry. I don't want to ban gas stoves. I don't want to ban gasoline-powered vehicles either. I want us to transition gradually. First, we need to develop the mines and the resources for green energy. And once we're ready, once we're done with that, once we have ample resources, resources in this country, not in others. Then we go ahead and start transitioning into green energy. But this is not what's happening. What's happening right now is when the 2020 crisis happened, a lot of these refiners, specifically the smaller ones, they happen to be independently owned. When the shutdown of the thing happened in 2020, they ran out of cash. They ran out of revenues. And they had a lot of debt because they had to incur a lot of debt since 2014 because oil prices went down. We let all of these refiners go bankrupt. We said, good, you know what? Maybe it's it's meant to be. Maybe this is the moment when we should transition to green energy and to hell with these refiners, to hell with the oil and gas industry. And the result is we have a massive shortage in refineries across the country. So you wonder why you're paying more at the pump. The refiners are charging more because they cannot handle the capacity anymore. And therefore, refiner stocks such as Valero and Marathon Petroleum, they're running sky high. They're acting as if they were technology stocks in the 20 teens. And the beauty is, even with the latest rally in these names, they remain undervalued. And this is why I love energy stocks right now. Yet this abrupt transition to green energy is not only beneficial to energy companies, we're talking about traditional energy companies such as oil and gas, it's also good for miners involved in the green energy development such as lithium miners, nickel miners. And again, it all stems from the misguided rushed policy that now created a double-edged inflation sword. On one hand, we see energy prices, be it oil and soon enough gas, moving higher because we killed the supply, we discouraged these energy companies from investing anymore. I mean, we're asking these companies to invest in more refiners, in more developments to increase the production of oil. But we're also saying, hey, folks, we're going to kill you. Down the road, we're going to end your business altogether. We're going to ban the use of gasoline. We're going to ban the use of oil. Why would these companies invest in their own demise? On the other edge of the sword, we've also created an insane amount of inflation in lithium prices, in nickel prices, because we've encouraged all of these auto manufacturers that if you transition from producing using regular cars to EV cars will give you all of these government credits and tax credits and increase the demand for your vehicles. And of course, the companies Ford, GM, the rest of them, they responded by saying, okay, we're going to scrap all of these plants where we used to manufacture regular vehicles, gas combustion engine vehicles, or we're going to go ahead and manufacture EVs instead. That increased the demand all of a sudden for batteries, supplies. Yet at the same time, we did not develop the lithium mines, the nickel mines, the graphite supplies. What did that do? It sent the prices of lithium sky high. And the majority of this lithium, by the way, comes out of China. So now we ended up in a shortage of new vehicles because the manufacturers, they can no longer secure these supplies. And even if they can, they're going to pay an arm and a leg for them and they're going to have to pass all of that cost all the way down to the end consumer. 
That is inflation. Inflation in new cars prices and the shortage of supply in new cars because they're waiting to manufacture all of these EVs caused inflation in the used cars market. And the reason is all of this demand for new vehicles when the consumer realizes that they cannot get their hand on any new vehicles anymore, they have to stampede and compete in the used cars market. And that did cause inflation. Now what we should have done instead is continue in the path that we were on to begin with, with hybrid vehicles, with more efficient combustion engines. The miles per gallon for cars was moving higher and higher and higher. We were becoming efficient. We could have continued in that path while we developed the lithium mines, the nickel mines, all of the supplies that we need for EVs. But we didn't do that. And folks, we can't cry over spilled milk now, but we can make money out of it. And this dynamic of demand rising higher for energies, yet the supply continues to move down. And we're not just talking about the raw product, the crude oil itself. We're talking about the refiners, the services that takes that raw product all the way to the end consumer for use. We have shortages across the chain. And the bottom line is this will cause energy prices to move higher and oil stocks will continue to move higher and higher and higher. So in our conversation of whether this is a new bull market or not, I gave you my two cents. It is not a bull market. This remains a bear market. But there is a bull market within a bear market and that is energy. And for now, this bull market will continue to run and produce more and more profits. And with that, folks, let's move on to cover the stock market information for you. We begin with the closing of the indices today, and here we go. The Dow Industrial Average in the green by 205.57 points or a gain of 0.61%. The Nasdaq leading the pack with gains worth 199.06 points or a gain of 1.76%. The S&P also marching higher with gains of 44.21 points worth 1 and 1 tenth of a percent. Now when we look at the sector's performances today, what do we see here? At number 1, capturing the gold medal, surprise surprise, energy. At number 2 for the silver, cyclicals. Number 3 for the bronze, communication services. The only laggard for the day, consumer defensives, and the reason is we got one bad earnings out of McCormick, and that pushed the entire sector down. When we look at the advanced to decline ratios, NYC 59% advancing versus 40% declining. The Nasdaq 48% advancing versus 49% declining. Folks, despite the rally, we are still at the neutral line, almost 50-50. Matter of fact, in the Nasdaq, 49% of the volume was declining, not advancing. And that tells us that the majority of the rally was led by by single names, individual names, the big cap kind of names, Tesla went higher by 10% and that distorted the readings in the indices all in all. Let's move on to commodities and see what's going on here. In the green for the most part, when we look at energy commodities, the WTI Brent for crude all up by more than 1% for the day, Brent more than 1.5%. Gasoline R Bob with gains of almost 1% for the day, heating oil futures also closing positive with gains worth almost 1.25%. Yet the beating in natural gas continues down yet another 3% today. Now here's what's going on with natural gas. We talked about the possibility of manipulation due to geopolitical purposes, but we also talked about the warmer weather across the board. But there is also an important factor here. This contract that you see right now is about to expire, I believe uh, Monday, next week, and we're going to have a new contract. Now the problem if you buy this contract right now, when you buy options for example and you leave them and they expire the money, you're now obligated in the case of buying calls to buy those underlying shares at the strike price that you bought the calls at. So there is an obligation on your end as a buyer of call options, put options. The same also happens in commodities. When you buy these contracts and they expire, you're now obligated to store all of this natural gas that you just bought. The problem is we don't have any storage facilities anymore. The storage keeps going down and down and down. Look at the S&P Global Natural Gas Storage Survey versus the EIA estimates. We're down big. And we know that the Freeport LNG facility is down, has been down for a long time. We got the news that they're back online now and the regulators gave them the go ahead to start production. In other in other words, the problem that we've seen in this contract that's about to expire, perhaps we're not going to see the same problems in the next contract. And in my opinion, this might encourage buyers to step in and resume buying natural gas contracts. Now, there was also another tailwind coming for natural gas, which is the residential slash commercial demand. We know it has been suppressed for now, but the outlook calls for more demand to come. There was more demand in the pipeline. And as you can see, the five-year range could push the demand even higher than the five-year average. If we have more winter storms, if we have more disruptions, we could see demand rocketing higher. And therefore, I say that we're running out of headwinds for 
natural gas. We're running out of sellers for natural gas. Or we're now meeting more tailwinds, a more buying opportunities, a more demand in the pipelines. My two cents, natural gas will move higher in no time. When it comes to softs, green across the board with massive gains here, lumber up by north of 5%, sugar closing with gains north of 3%, coffee with gains of almost 3%, and then we have more modest gains for cocoa, cotton, and OJ futures. When it comes to metals, not as hot as energy, for example, gold, platinum, palladium all down for the day, yet we have a pop in copper worth around 1%, while we have more muted gains for silver futures today. When it comes to meats, a down day for live and feeder cattle futures, although lean hogs moving higher with gains of almost 2%. Likewise, we have a rebound in grains, the contracts are being updated, but we're seeing more demand coming, be it in soybeans, soybean meal, corn, wheat, oats, all moving higher. So again, I caution from the folks who say inflation is dead. The Fed has to pivot. You have absolutely no clue what you're talking about. On to the big casino. The options market, what do we see here? The volume was muted all in all, believe it or not. We continue to rally based on the algos and the low volume stupidity. This is not sustainable. I've been telling you this for a long time now. Yet the market continues to move higher and higher and higher because we have no resistance at all to this algorithmic low volume rally. What does that mean, resistance? It means we're not seeing a surge in buying put options that forces the market maker to change their planning here by perhaps dumping some shares. And most importantly, the majority of the shorts, the majority of the bears are waiting till the aftermath of the FOMC before pulling the trigger and shorting the market and bidding against it. So for now, it's a one-way street. No wonder why we continue to see these low volume rallies. And while the volume all in all was down in the casino, the volume for Tesla was moving significantly higher. But it wasn't folks chasing the rally. It was actually folks fading the rip. Tesla at number one with around 2 million contracts traded today. About 52.5% of those were puts. On the other hand, Amazon at number two with around 800,000 contracts traded today. Look at this. About 70% of those were calls. Are they seeing something that the rest of us are not seeing? Or are they betting blindly here? We got the results from Microsoft. AWS will be a disaster here. On top of that, we got the news about the consumer weakening. Retail sales and online stores were down by more than 1%. We're talking about stores such as Amazon. So I don't see the source of optimism here. But the beauty is, the higher it goes, the bigger the opportunity to short. And then at number three, we have Apple with 800,000 contracts traded today. About 57% of those were calls. Moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. We start with the ticker IWM, the Russell 2000. Now the Russell was the leader, was the leading indicator in reality to the rally year to date. And I said repeatedly that in the first week of trading this year, watch what the IWM is doing. The IWM is outperforming and it will continue to outperform. That is the indicator that we have a rally in the Dow, the NASDAQ, the SPY. But today and as of late, the last couple of days, the IWM has been the laggard. Today, for example, the IWM underperformed by a lot. So is it a leading indicator for upcoming weakness in the larger indices? Well, this trade suggests not really because we have somebody who bought the 202 calls for the expiration date, April 21st, with expectations that the IWM could move higher and gain more than 7.5% percent by then. They paid around two bucks and 25 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around 3.3 million dollars. And then what about the ticker PYPL PayPal? Somebody sees the name pulling back again. They bought the 75 puts for the expiration date February 10th with expectations that PayPal could move down and lose more than six percent of its value by then. They paid around two bucks a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around 1.3 million dollars. And then what about the ticker NUE Nucor? A hot, hot, hot name for the year. China reopening, steel prices are moving higher. So far, so good. But did it run too high too fast, prompting a pullback to come? This is at least what this trade is betting on. Buying the 155 puts for the expiration date, February 17th, with expectations that NUE will move down and lose more than 9% of the value by then. They paid around one buck and 20 cents a piece. Stanner, this trade all in all, spending around $600,000. And then what about the trade for the ticker GM for GM, General Motors? Now Tesla is stealing the thunder away from GM and Ford with the discounts and Tesla is running hot. The problem for GM and Ford they cannot afford to cut prices. Tesla has a lot of cash. Their margins are pretty good. They can afford to cut rates for a little while. Not for GM and Ford. But somebody sees a positive catalyst coming for GM for some reason. And they bought the 38.5 calls for the expiration date. 
February 17th, with expectations that GM could move higher and gain more than 5.5% by then. They paid around 70 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending around $350,000. And then what about the ticker AU for Anglo Gold? Gold has been hot year to date, but somebody's fading the rip here. They bought the 20 bucks puts for the expiration date, April 21st, with expectations that AU will move down and lose more than 8% of its value by then. They paid around one buck a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending around half a million dollars. And last but not least, what about the ticker C-A-R car for Avis? I don't understand why this name is trading as high as it is right now. I think this is one of the best remaining opportunities to short right now. A lot of names went down 60-70% from the top. This name happens to be one of the few ones that are still standing with bad fundamentals. But somebody's seeing through that and they bought the 150 puts for the expiration date March 17th. With expectations that car could move down and lose more than 20% of its value by then. They paid around 4 bucks and 20 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all spending around 1.7 million dollars and then what about the heat map analysis what do we see here again the revival of the risk on theme the migrating back into tech into chips into communication services into cyclicals into the travel names and they're abandoning what they're abandoning the big pharma the defensives even gold got abandoned today but the reason why i like energy whether we have rotations into value or back into risk on it doesn't matter energy continues to outperform in any theme risk on risk off doesn't matter because the fundamentals and energy Energy are really really good now we have some names that went down big due to earnings such as northrop in oc also in industrials we have csx in defensives we have diago deo which went down big and big pharma we have pfizer down again due to a downgrade but as i told you and uh, shared with you before i'm using the opportunity here to go long pfizer be it by calls or buying the stock all the way till earnings and then take it from there we also have names such as ibm down big due to earnings and in airlines we have another name down big that is uh, southwest airlines and the reason is they lost 800 million dollars due to the holiday fiasco now let's talk about some corporate news and we begin with the tsunami of layoffs we continue to follow the story out of google and the brutality of these layoffs for example a company recruiter said that he discovered he lost his job after a call with one of his candidates suddenly disconnected can you imagine that somebody's recruiting you and then they find hey wait a minute i got a call here i think i just lost my job and bro you you're interviewing me for a job you just lost yours who am i talking to here and when it rains it pours the tsunami continues today we got announcements from dow cutting about 2,000 jobs to save one billion dollars we also got an announcement from mccormick with more layoffs to come and after the bell we have another one hasbro also announced cutting 15 percent of its workforce and on top of that we also got Foot Locker announcing cutting staff yet in the case of Foot Locker even the executives are not immune some executives also lost their jobs the good news is if you lost your job in google or meta or microsoft we have chipotle adding 15,000 jobs in north america chipotle is open for business so you can go ahead and work chipotle now let's talk about the outperformers today we begin with tesla massive rally for the day and now we're getting more information about the 420 tweet by reverend elon musk the rev now says that he canceled the whole take tesla private because of tesla wage Kathy Wood who convinced him not to sell the company and by the way what the hell is going on here with Elon's head it looks like it got into a compressor maybe we should add this emoji next to Sam bankrupt frauds emoji we'll see now here's another app to former today Blackstone the ticker BX shooting higher so what happened earnings came out pristine absolutely not earnings went down by 41% but I guess Blackstone will also announce laying off employees and now we have layoff optimism and this pushed the stock higher more layoffs folks that's good news great news for the company absolute delusion but anyways let's talk about the heat map for the etfs and what do we see here mostly in the green with few exceptions but again the rally was led by energy the xle xop oih all popping higher growth continues to outperform value but value is not doing bad either and of course it's just a matter of time the moment the dollar pops higher we will see value outperforming growth again and most importantly we will see the rally in international etfs fading away now let's do some charts here and then wrap it up we begin with the spy the s&p 500 30 minutes chart what do we see here today we got a gap higher and then it crapped all the way to the support of the gap got support then the chart moved higher all the way till the end of the day closing at the highs almost at the next resistance at around 405 yet despite all of this 
it is doing so based on negative RSI. In other words, the recent move is weak. The recent move is not sustainable. The recent move will be met by a flush down. Look back in all of these low volume rallies that we had even during bull markets, by the way, in 2020, 2021, even in bull markets, they were met by a flush down. And the reason is simple here. The reason is mechanical. When we have a low volume rally based on call options, based on the gamma squeeze, the market maker has to play along and continue to buy the underlying stock over and over and over again as a hedge to these call options they're selling. If the sellers, the actual sellers, the bears, the shorts, if they don't show up, the market maker has no other choice but to continue to play the game and pump the charts higher and higher and higher because they're buying the underlying stock. But the market maker is not interested in holding these stocks. Once expiration comes upon us, we see all of these call option holders dumping their positions. The market maker responds by dumping the underlying equities. And therefore, these mechanical moves are not sustainable. Sustainable rallies happen via organic buying. When the institutionals, the retail cohort, they start buying the underlying stocks. Because that is conviction. You're not going to buy the stock. It moves 5% and then you dump it right away. You're buying a core position. This is not the case in this latest rally. And if we zoom out a little bit when we talk about 405 as resistance, this is even stiffer as a resistance than 398 and 391. And therefore, my expectations are the SPY is not going to make it above 405 by the end of the week. We'll see what happens. Here is the daily chart for the continuous contract, the S&P 500. What do we see here? It is above 4,000. 37, an important line, but did it earn? Did it earn the axis? The answer is absolutely not, because throughout the week, the chart did not produce any needed evidence to move above the line. The move was forced because of low volume and mechanical reasons. In other words, we're going to revisit this battle of 4037 again. But for now, the RSI remains positive. The MACD indicator confirms that we have bullish momentum here. Looking at the chart all in all, absent of the sellers coming back, the rally shall continue because there is is no resistance here. The chart can continue to go higher and higher and higher until we hit the expiration date or something triggers selling to come back. And that something could be the core PCE coming out tomorrow or the ultimate one, the FOMC next week. What about the Q's 30 minutes chart? What do we see here? Again, similar phenomenon, a gap and crap all the way almost to the gap support, then a rebound, closing at the highs of the day. And the resistance we're looking at right now is 294.33 with the support being 290, which is supposed to be stiff resistance. In other words, the chart did not earn the pass and the entry above 290. You look at the hour side remains in negative divergence. Not a good sign for the sustainability of the rally. Now, that doesn't mean you can't play it via day trading activities because we have a pattern at least for now we see a pop in the morning it fades away and then after the first two hours of the day when the volume recedes and we see the algos taking charge we see the index moving higher again so you can play these things after the initial drop you buy some call options close them by the end of the day in out hello goodbye but do you trust the rally do you bid on it in the long run i don't think so here's the daily chart for the continuous contract the nasdaq we're getting closer and closer to 12,207. the rsi remains positive and it's firming up along with the MACD but of course if you happen to be a bear you want this RSI on the daily to get as high as it can right before the FOMC because the risk versus reward becomes it's gonna flush down and the reason is the rally was front loaded before the FOMC and if Powell comes out negating this rally and this assumption we could see a correction in a big way which will be done via flush down as a bear you don't want to see the market consolidating for now you don't want to see it going down because if that is the case the risk versus reward becomes that maybe Powell will give the green light for the rally to continue when we zoom in to the two hours chart for the continuous contract for the Nasdaq. What do we see here? We have a channel for now, higher highs and higher lows. And it appears today we hit the higher high, the limit, the resistance, and the assumption becomes for a pullback. Will the pullback take us all the way to the lower range of this channel? Will it take us away below 11,689 by the end of the week, meaning tomorrow? If that is the case, that will be a major bearish signal. I doubt it will happen that fast, so the bulls have to keep 11,689 as support by the end of the week. What about the IWM 30 minutes chart? What do we see here? A gap higher, stopped at 189.84, pulled down, turned negative, unlike the NASDAQ. Now, a lot of folks believe that the IWM is the leading indicator, so the relative weakness today is a sign for concern. Despite that, we got a rebound, the buyers showed up, and most importantly, the IWM managed to close above 188. Now, the challenge becomes, can it close the week above or below 188? A close above confirms that the rally goes on all the way till the FOMC, 
a close below would be a leading indicator for problems ahead, not just for the IWM, but also for the Dow, SPY, and the Qs. What about the Dixie? What do we see here? It is showing signs for life, but it's not getting the spark. It's not getting the catalyst. It's missing that spark in order to pop higher. Now, could the spark come from tomorrow's PCE's rating, perhaps? But the ultimate catalyst for this spark is the FOMC. Looking at the chart right now, the risk versus reward says that we will see a pop in the dollar in the aftermath of the FOMC. If that is the case, what happens to gold? Gold will go down. It has to lose another support. For now, it didn't lose 1925. But if the dollar moves higher, it's going to lose 1925. Not only that, perhaps 1895 and then ultimately going down to the most important support, in my opinion, 1842. Is it going to lose that number? Too early to say. My hunch is it will be a strong support. Now, what about Brent oil? What do we see here? No problems. Above 85, flirting with 90, making higher highs, higher lows. No problems here. When we look at the weekly chart, we have a crossing in the MACD indicator, suggesting a beginning of a new bullish momentum. So we have no problems here in oil at all. And if the Fed comes out a little easy, that will be yet another catalyst for oil to move higher because the dollar will go down further. Now, I doubt that's going to happen because Powell and the Fed, they have a mission in rescuing the US dollar. That is their best defense against inflation. They keep the dollar higher. Now, what about the 10-year yield? What do we see here? My hunch is, my bet is, we will see a pop in the 10-year along with the dollar. But again, we're waiting for a catalyst. In the last few days, we have seen massive auctions in the bond market. Massive demand, which should push yields down big time. But yields, despite all of that selling, continue to hold on. I see this as a sign of relative strength, meaning a pop coming in the 10 year. It's just waiting for a spark. And the dollar in the 10-year pop higher, the rally in the Nasdaq ends. TLT, a daily chart, what do we see here? We have weakening momentum, negative divergences on the RSI, the MACD. My hunch is we go down to 103.5 and then take it from there. VIX, what's going on here in the 4 hours chart? Even if we have a pullback in the Nasdaq, the SPY tomorrow, we could see the VIX going down along with them. Because the VIX right now is so distorted, it doesn't matter anymore. But from a technical setup right now, the assumption is the VIX goes down in a retest to 18, that could be a double bottom bottom and then it moves higher from that point on. Apple, 30 minutes, what do we see here? We got the gap, then the crap, retouching the gap support line. Not the gap from today, but the gap from yesterday. So far, so good. Apple catches a bit, closes at the highs of the day, but not making a higher high for the day. Sign for concern, perhaps, but it doesn't mean it's going to stall here because the bets in the options market, the majority of them at least, are for the 145. So they could force the market maker here to go all the way to 145 before we see Apple stalling and reversing. And by the way, if it gets to 145, let's say by tomorrow, for example, I'll be buying Apple puts in an earnings play. It doesn't mean I'm going to hold them all the way till the report comes out, but I'm going to hold them and watch them appreciate as we get to earnings and then dump them right before the print. I did the same strategy today with, um, not IBM, what is the other one? Intel. I did buy Intel calls at around 9, 9.30 Pacific time. And of course, thankfully, <laughs> I did dump them by the end of the day. I bought them for about 45 cents a piece. I dumped them for about one buck a piece right before the close. And after the close, Intel is a disaster zone. Down by about, what, 10%? Folks, we have these plays that you can get in and out really quickly, but I don't share these kind of trades because they're high risk and I don't want to be the reason for you taking more risk than you should. Another one I played today is NOW service now. It popped higher big time in the morning. It got really really overboard. I did buy next week's puts and then I took a nap and I woke up about half an hour later and they appreciated by about 200%. So there are a lot of earnings plays here but you gotta be quick. When it comes to Apple you gotta plan ahead because all of these options are gonna appreciate in value as we head closer to earnings. So what is your pre-earnings play? What is your post post earnings play. You gotta have a plan here, folks. What about Tesla an hourly chart? What do we see here? Big pop higher, lots of short covering today, in the pre-market at least. And the chart is now above, uh, by the way, this is an hourly chart. The chart is now above 155.25. It went down and retested that level over and over again, and then it moved higher. Now here's the thing, folks. The long trade in Tesla is over in my eye. Does that mean you short it right now? The answer is, give it about a few days. The three days rule at least, let the short covering be over. If it loses 155.25, then that solidifies the case for buying puts and betting for Tesla going down all the way to closing the gap and maybe touching the trend line again. Now look, I was the one who called the rally in Tesla where nobody expected it's going to happen. Take a look.
I still hold the February calls and the reason is you look at the chart of TSLA oversold still holding ground still we have positive divergence from the RSI we have a MACD indicator that is bottoming all indicators that we will see a rally in Tesla coming we just need a spark here folks and the spark I'm looking for is a replacement of the CEO if that happens pay attention now if that happens there's a condition here we could see a major short covering rally in Tesla that could lead us all the way as high as 169 and here's the update folks while we did not get the catalyst that I was looking for the replacement of the CEO perhaps we got a more uh, polished CEO because Reverend Elon Musk was a professional in the call of course he was hyping and pumping per usual that's nothing new but he was more professional he answered a lot of questions he seemed more responsible but most importantly what about the chart now I said it could go all the way to 169 and that could be the case and therefore those uh, waiting to short give it a few days don't jump right away either it breaks 155.25 decisively that would be your signal or give it a few days watch for the reversal at around 169 a reversal candle a confirmation and then short it from that point on for folks who want to jump in and buy tesla shares right now or call options your johnny come lately the opportunity was in the beginning of the year and even in december when everybody and their mothers were betting against the souffle last but not least what about tulips what do we see here stalling at around 23 189 does it need to go down to find support before moving higher the answer is yes in my assessment but notice that in the challenge of 20,593.34 Bitcoin did not need to go down or break that support and seek for another support to gather energy and crack above it again but here's the thing this time around the chart is not facing the test of support the chart is facing the test of resistance in other words if it doesn't crack above it by the end of the week meaning tomorrow then it needs to go down and seek of support below and if it finds support so far so good the problem is what if it doesn't find support all the way until 20,000 593.34 and then we see a rebound the risk becomes a formation of a head and shoulder so you got to keep an eye on that i'm not saying it's going to happen i'm saying something you got to think about anyhow moving on to the conclusion of this video what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow most importantly we have the pce price index and the core PCE, which is the Fed's favorite, we have disposable income and consumer spending, along with a late reading of the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index and inflation expectations on top of pending home sales. Now, when it comes to the earnings calendar, we have Chevron and American Express. And with that, folks, this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I will talk to you again over the weekend. Take care. Let's go make a killing.